morning and welcome to today's Living with Kidney Cancer webinar. Today's webinar is one of a series of Living with Kidney Cancer webinars that Kidney Cancer UK are arranging to replace Living with Kidney Cancer days, the hugely popular days that we've had throughout the country. We know now that we cannot continue to do these over the next few months, but hopefully we'll be able to, to look again at how we manage this next year. Meantime, we'd love to hear from you about topics and, and, and interests that you have for, um, for these webinars. So to introduce myself, my name is Mo Johnson and I'm one of the nurses in the health professional team for Kidney Cancer UK. Our topic today is treating small kidney tumours. This is an insight into surgery and cryoablation. I'd like to welcome our speakers. Gren Oates is a urology surgeon from Glasgow and he's going to be talking about treating small kidney tumours with partial nephrectomy. Dr Des Alcorn is a consultant radiologist and intervention specialist from Garton Naval General Hospital in Glasgow and he's going to be talking to us about cryoablation. And Mike Tunstall, who lives in the Midlands, is going to talk today about his experience of having kidney cancer and cryoablation. First of all, let's head over to Mr Grenville Oates, who's going to talk about small kidney tumours. Good morning, everyone. I, I'm, I'm Gwen Oates. I'm talking to you from uh, the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow. I hope you can see the blue sky behind me. It's quite um, a rare thing in Glasgow, but it's very sunny today. And I'm going to talk to about you about um, small kidney tumours and the role of partial nephrectomy. Um, I'm going to give you just a bit of background first. Um, first of all, I'm going to tell you that the instance of kidney cancer in the UK is rising and it's been rising um, for the past two or three decades. Um, it's twice as common in men as in women, but you can see it's rising in both sexes. It may be plateauing off in the last few years. Um, and there's probably several reasons for this. Um, if you read a medical school textbook, it tells you that kidney cancer presents like this. So patients have um, pain, they have sometimes a palpable lump in their loin and they present with frank hematuria or bleeding in the urine. Um, but to be honest, that's very, very rare these days. And I've only seen a handful of patients in, in the past 10 years who present like that. And most patients I see with kidney cancer these days present like this. So they go to see their GP um, with some vague uh, complaints or some maybe some unrelated complaint. And they have an, on, uh, an ultrasound scan and that ultrasound scan picks up a small lump in their kidney that's totally asymptomatic, and they didn't really know that they had it until they had the scan. Um, and this is really what we're talking about. So this is a CT scan and um, the black arrow on that CT scan is pointing to a small lump in the right kidney. Um, and now when you go to your doctor, you get scanned um, for almost any minor ailment or complaint. And I think that probably at least partially explains why we're seeing more and more kidney cancer these days. Um, and this is quite interesting. If you look at um, over the past two decades about um, the, how kidney cancer presents, um, this here, stage one, so early stage kidney cancer over the past two decades has been increasing um, in frequency. And you can see now um, about, about half or more than half of our patients are presenting with very, very early stage disease. And the people with stage two kidney cancer, um, we've seen um, a reduction in people presenting with sort of larger but organ confined tumours. I think what's interesting to note when, we when we're doing this talk is that people who are presenting with advanced kidney cancer over the same time hasn't really changed. So to just tell you again that for the rest of the talk, um, Dr. Olcon and I are going to focus on the treatment of early stage kidney tumours. And what we're really talking about here is kidney tumours that are less than four centimetres in size. Um, and most of these tumours um, are occurring in um, a slightly older population. So there you can see that if you look at um, patients registered with the British Association of Urological Surgeons with early stage tumours less than four centimetres, the majority of them are in their eighth decade of life. Um, I know some of you out there are not medically trained, so I wanted to talk to you a bit about the difference between uh, cancerous and non-cancerous tumours, so benign versus malignant renal tumour. A benign tumour is a tumour that can grow and expand where it is, um, but it can't spread. It can't spread by invasion into things nearby it, and it can't spread by the lymphatic system or the blood system and crop up in other um, places of your body. So they tend to be much, much less dangerous and they're not referred to as cancer. 
a malignant tumor or a cancerous tumor is a tumor that can grow, but it can also invade into things um, next to it, and it can spread to other parts of your body, either by the lymphatic system or by blood vessels. Um, and when we've identified these small lumps in people's kidneys, I think it's important for you to realize that not all of them are cancerous. So some of them are benign growths. Um, and the bigger the tumor is, the less likely that is. But if you look at the tumors that we're interested in, so those tumors that are less than four centimeters in size, then about a quarter of them will not be cancers. Um, and kidney cancer, uh, and these tumors can be a variety of things. Um, so we said they're not kidney cancers. There are many tif different types of cancer and many different types of non-cancerous lumps that you can get in your kidney. Um, and even renal cancer, the ones that are cancer, um, there are many, many different types of cancer that behave in different ways um, and can be related to different mutations in some of the genes that you have in your body. Um, so before we treat um, these small renal masses um, in the west of Scotland, we biopsy them. And when you, when, um, and this is quite controversial, but when you're doing a biopsy of a renal mass, you need to know whether or not it's safe. Um, and certainly biopsying renal cancers in the hands of Dr. Alcorn and his co colleagues is very safe. Um, there's a minimal risk of bleeding, um, reports of serious complications from biopsy and renal masses are very, very low. And with modern biopsy techniques, the biopsies have no chance of spreading the tumor around the body at a time. We also, need, we also need to know if it's accurate and is it necessary? Um, well, they are quite accurate, but it's not always straightforward. And certainly when you biopsy these kidney cancers, you get a very, very small bit of tissue for the pathologist to look at down a microscope. And as you can see here, um, when we've talked about the difference between cancerous and non-cancerous tumors, things can look very, very similar, but behave very, very differently. And a lot of our tumors, um, we do have tumors that can be cancerous and non-cancerous that look very, very similar down a microscope. And it can be sometimes very, very difficult to tell the two apart with a tiny piece of tissue that they get. Um, well, is it necessary? The whole point of biopsy in these tumors is because we want to save people who've got non-cancerous small lumps in their kidney from um, going through things like this. So this is an old slide of um, uh, someone who's had a radical nephrectomy, a, a removal of a whole kidney. Um, um, it was first described in, in the late 1960s. And at that time, we used to remove your whole kidney, including all the fat and the fascia around it. We used to take all the lymph nodes around, out around your kidney. And we also used to remove the adrenal gland at the same time. Um, so I would say doing a biopsy is necessary if we can avoid doing that to patients. Um, but we've moved on from that and we've moved on from that for, um, mainly for this reason. And, and this is a slide that looks at people's kidney. This is a study that was done and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It looked at people's um, kidney function. And you can see here that if your kidney function, your glomerular filtration rate is normal, um, or if it's severely impaired, it has um, a significant impact on your risk of um, the dying from any cause. So basically the worse your kidney function is, the um, the worst the risk is to you, not dying of kidney cancer, but dying of other things like heart disease and hypertension and strokes and things like that. So based on these studies, we decided that if we could save as much healthy kidney function as we could, then that was better for patients. Um, and this is called a Kaplan-Meier curve. And, and this looks at um, people diagnosed with kidney cancer and their chances of still being alive um, uh, well, in this case, 100 months after the operation. And you can see if you remove just the tumor or you remove the whole kidney, your chances of suffering from late effects of the cancer are just the same. So there's no advantage in taking your whole kidney account out if we can get away with just removing the tumor and saving the healthy bit of the kidney. Um, so I suppose when we're discussing how to treat small renal tumors, the first thing we need to know is what happens if we do nothing, if we just keep an eye on them. And that's a very, very reasonable thing to do in lots of patients with kidney cancer is not to intervene and to save people the, the risks and the complications of any intervention that we do. Um, and some people have done that. They've looked at kidney cancers and they've looked at how they, cha how they change over the time. And we know that these tumors grow very, very slowly. Um, and in this study that looked at uh, a couple of hundred people with kidney cancer, the chance of them spreading um, spread into distant parts of your body where they become much more dangerous um, over three or four years is very, very low. In this study, it was less than one in a hundred. Um, 
and sometimes keeping an eye, an eye on kidney tumors is the right thing to do. So this CT scan here is, is looking at a patient with von hippel lindau disease. Now that's a, an inherited condition where they have a mutation, where patients have a mutation that predisposes them to kidney cancer. And if we look at these kidneys here, every one of these little cysts and lumps is a tiny kidney cancer. Um, and the way we manage these patients is we, we, we observe these small tumors until they reach a size um, that starts to worry us before we intervene to try and avoid them having to have both their kidneys removed and obviously that would mean them going on kidney dialysis. Um, and we know it's relatively safe to, to observe these tumors if they're very, very small. So if tumors are less than two centimeters, the chance of them being high grade or pathologically more advanced that we think on metastasizing around your body is very, very low. It's not zero, but it's very, very low. Um, observing them is complicated. Um, now this is called a waterfall plot and every one of these little sticks on this plot represents um, the change in size of a small renal mass as it was watched over several months. Um, uh, and you can see that these patients have been biopsied um, and the little green lines represent non-cancerous tumours and the little orange lines represent cancerous tumours. And I think the important thing I wanted to show you here is that some of the orange lines represent cancerous tumours when we watched them and didn't do anything to them got smaller. So just keeping an eye on a tumour and looking and, and monitoring its size is not necessarily um, a very helpful thing to do. Um, if you look at guidelines, then um, guidelines tell you that if you have a small kidney cancer, then the treatment of choice should be a partial nephrectomy or nephron sparing surgery. And that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit about now. Um, this is what a partial nephrectomy is. So it's a graphical reputation that shows you that we... Um, have a kidney that has a small tumor here in the lower part of it um, and during the operation we will mobilize the kidney we will control the blood supply to the kidney by putting a little clamp on its artery and its vein and we remove uh, the kidney tumor um, and then repair the defect that we have in the kidney um, and the aim of that partial nephrectomy is to number one cure the cancer but number two make sure that we've preserved as much of the kidney of the healthy kidney tissue and the healthy kidney function as we can um, and the way we preserve that um, is by making sure that we select patients who have healthy kidneys in the first place uh, making sure that we remove only the minimum amount of uh, normal tissue necessary to make sure that we've removed the kidney tumor and we make sure that we operate very very quickly because when we've blocked the blood supply off to the kidney, then that kidney starts to die. And the quicker we can operate, the quicker we can move the tumor and repair the kidney and restore the blood supply to the kidney, then the better that kidney has of making a full recovery, better chance that kidney has of making a full recovery. Uh, times have changed over the past few years. And if you'd come to Glasgow 20 years ago, we would have done that um, using a scalpel to a cut in your loin. Uh, but these days, um, uh, in most parts of the UK and certainly further afield, we've moved on forward on to doing this um, with the help of these robotic surgical machines. I had hoped to show you um, a video of that, but it was difficult to play on the on the webinar. But we'll try and we'll try and give you a link to that after the talk. Um, the main I don't know if you can see me on the screen, but robotic surgery. Um, just to give you, I think some, some, sometimes people have a false idea of what it means. The robot doesn't do the operation; it just makes it very much easier. For the surgeon to do the operation and it gives us a number of advantages the small advantages it gives us are um, the ability to see in three dimensions three dimensions and the ability to see a magnified image it also um, does something called motion scaling so if we're doing normal laparoscopic surgery when we move our instruments they move just the same distance outside the body as inside the body and with a robot we can set it so things can move three or five or ten times as far outside the body as they do inside the body and that means we can do much finer movements inside the body and it means if you have a slight tremor or something like that then the robot dilutes that out for you but the main advantage of the robot over conventional laparoscopic surgery is the robot has a wrist so when you're suturing it's much easier to suture when you have a wrist that does this than if you have um if you're trying to suture when you can't bend your wrist at all and so that's the advantage that the robot gives us. But the surgeon drives the robot. The robot doesn't do the operation. Not all tumors are suitable to be done with keyhole surgery. So we have ways that we can we can score a tumor, um, and it would tell us how easy on how not easy that is to do. 
And obviously, if you have a small tumor that's stuck on your uh, stuck on the outside of the kidney, and it's towards the top or the bottom, that's much easier than a bigger tumor that grows very very deep into the middle of the kidney. And about a quarter of the tumors that we remove in surgery will still do an old-fashioned way by making a big cut. And that's again just a picture of the robotic system. So you can see the surgeon sits at a console. It's a little bit like a video game, and he controls the arms of the robot that have instruments through little keyholes inside the patient. And actually, if we look at what treatments are being offered to people um, around the UK now with um, these small renal tumors, you can see it's very much dependent on your age and that really means it's very much dependent on your fitness. So still a lot of people with early renal tumors are getting the whole kidney removed. But if you're very young, then we could try and offer you um, a partial nephrectomy or a nephron sparing surgery. Um, and obviously older patients, uh, have a less chance of being operated on and it's more likely that maybe we'll just observe their tumors and keep an eye on them and make sure they're not growing in an aggressive fashion. Um, there are other treatments available and I'm now going to hold, ha hand you over to Dr. Alcorn who's going to talk to you about um, other ways that we can try and treat your cancer but preserve the nephrons in your kidney and preserve your kidney function. I think we're going to take questions at the end of all this but many thanks for listening. Thank you very much, um, Gren. That, that was a really informative talk. And welcome to, to Dr. Des Alcorn, who is going to talk about cryoablation. I'm going to talk about percutaneous cryoablation of small renal tumours. And a lot of what I was going to say, Gren has already said, so, so that's good. I won't need to say it again. So what is cryoablation? How does it work? When do we use it? Um, how do we follow the patients up? And, and does it actually work? So cryoablation is a means of inserting several tiny probes into a kidney tumor. And we usually do this in the CT scanner or occasionally we'll do it in ultrasound. And very, very occasionally we'll do it in theater with the urologists. Um, and essentially what we do is we put in some small probes and then we switch them on and we freeze. And the nice thing about cryoablation is we can freeze a predictable volume of tumor so that our results are, are, are hopefully quite, quite predictable. And it is one of several types of thermal and non-thermal ablation uh, techniques. And other techniques that are available are radiofrequency ablation and microwave ablation, which essentially heat up and desiccate the tumor and destroy it. And there is a new technique called irreversible electroporation, which essentially is a means of electrocuting tumors. So it doesn't involve heat or cooling. It simply involves electrocuting the tumors as a means of destroying the cells. So how does cryoablation work? And the reason I've shown this uh, tire and valve here is you probably remember when you let a tire down the valve gets cold and essentially what we're doing is called joule kelvin effect or joule thompson effect where a gas which is being compressed is then released and as it's released it expands and as it expands um, there's a drop in temperature so that's um, joule kelvin uh, effect uh, lord kelvin is is one of the uh, famous scientists um, from glasgow and this is what we use. This is an ice sphere. So this is the probe that goes down into the tumor. And we may use three, four, five, maybe up to 10 of these probes that go into tumors, depending on the size. And this is just a pen, just to give you an idea of the size of the tumor. So it's roughly the size of the lead of a pencil. Now I did this drawing, I'm very proud of it, but actually when you project it, it's a bit rubbish. But anyway, uh, this is uh, what the cryoprobe looks like. And there are several chambers here. So this is the outer chamber, and this is basically like a thermos flask. So this bit is insulated. This is the inner channel, and then there's an outer channel. And what we do is we insert this into the tumor, then we pump argon down the inner channel. It expands into the larger outer channel. And as it's expanding, the tip of the needle cools down and ice is formed. And because this area of the needle is insulated, the ice is restricted to the tip of the needle. 
in the olden days when I started doing this technique in, in 2011, we didn't have this insulated part in the needle and the ice actually tracked up the needle and could actually be seen coming out the patient's skin. And sometimes they got a little bit of frostbite, a little black dot where the needle had been. Didn't do them any harm, but um, it's much nicer now that the, the needles are insulated. And we've got different types of needles and we use a combination of different types of needles. And each different type of needle produces a different shape of ice ball or a different size of ice ball. And you can see the very fine needles produce a very small ice ball. And these larger needles, a uh, huge ice ball. And we use a combination of these to get the ice ball in the size and the shape that we want. And once the needles are inserted, we can actually put different needles on at different pars. And again, that helps us mold the shape of the ice ball depending on the shape of the tumor. So this is what it looks like in real life. It, it's certainly not as fancy as Gren's robot. And this is our old machine. Uh, we were lucky enough to get uh, a new machine funded by, by kidney cancer charity. So we've got the pictures up here of the patient's kidney tumor. We've got the machine here and we've got the probes going through the skin uh, and you can see here the probes are getting really, really cold, but the actual skin is, is protected by this insulation. So what do we do? The procedure is done usually under a general anaesthetic. More recently, and, and given the COVID situation and the difficulties we've been having getting uh, patients put to sleep, um, because of the aerosols that are produced at the time of intubation, we've been using more conscious sedation, the CT scanner. But essentially, you don't remember anything about it at all. You're either asleep or you're so sedated that you don't have any, any recollection of the events. We lie on the table and the position we put you on the table depends where the tumor is. Sometimes tumors are at the back or at the front. We try to put the arms out of the way. And the reason we do that is when the arms are down, the x-rays have to go through your arms and it just makes the images less clear. And what we do is we get the patient, uh, their breathing suspended and the needles can hold the patient's breath uh, for a short time as we pop the needles in. And that has the advantage that the kidney doesn't move up and down. Uh, and, as you're breathing normally, your kidney moves about seven or eight centimeters. And if you can imagine, if you've got a small tumor that's three or four centimeters in size and it's moving eight or 10 centimeters up, it's like uh, trying to hit a, a moving target. We have this facility called CT Fluoro, which essentially gives us the images almost in real time. So we're able to put the probes into the tumor and then we take a very, very small scan and that confirms the, the position. And this is what it looks like. This is the CT scanner here. This is the patient lying here under drapes. And this is our old machine here. And these are the big tanks of helium and argon. And I think when the patient comes down to the CT scanner, they're gonna be put to sleep in the CT scanner and they see these enormous cylinders they almost look like missiles and unfortunately they sit outside the scanner and the patient is wheeled past them. But the thing is that the gas in these cylinders, although it goes through the needles, doesn't actually go into the patient at all. It just gets vented and scavenged into the room. So although we're using a lot of gas, the gas isn't actually uh, in the patient at all. This is another slide. There's just the pictures that we see as we're doing the procedure. You can see two very content anaesthetists in, in the background there. And once the patient is asleep, their job is basically done until we wake the patient up again. And we plan out what we're going to do. In this case, we were going to put four needles in. We use different channels. And the idea is we put the needles throughout the tumor and we gradually build up this sort of compound ice ball um, and engulf and completely destroy the tumor. Sometimes it can get quite kind of busy. Again, it's not as busy as, as Grand Slide with all the, the, the different ports, but we, we can use quite a lot of needles. So when do we use it? And we tend to use it as an alternative to surgery in some patients where surgery is felt less optimal. So in the patients that Gren thinks 
surgery wouldn't be a good idea, the alternative would be to use thermal ablation and in our centre, cryoablation. And these are the indications that we've had for the last 100 cryos in Glasgow. So usually per kidney function, that is frequently associated with a single kidney. So that kidney might have been removed previously for a tumour or for stone disease or for something else. Quite often the patients we get have other comorbidities, previous cancer. If the colon surgeons have been in and the abdomen is sort of hostile for using robotic or open surgery, quite often we would get uh, patients for, for cryoablation because that doesn't really affect our ability to get at the tumour uh, particularly badly. Gren mentioned uh, von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. There's another syndrome called berthog dube syndrome, which again, um, patients get uh, small renal tumours qu quite early on and will get further tumours later on. So if we can preserve kidney function um, by doing uh, cryoablation and I think that is a benefit to the patient. Some patients that have failed active surveillance, active surveillance, failing active surveillance simply means that the tumour is continuing to grow at a rate that we feel we have to do something. Some patients get their tumours removed by surgery and they get small areas of recurrence in the renal bed and we can quite often treat those with, with cryoablation as well. Sometimes patients opt for, for freezing over surgery and that's maybe because they've had a bad experience of surgery previously or because they're, they just feel frail and they don't feel up to it. Uh, and that's a very small number. I think usually, although it's patient's choice about what surgery or what treatment they get, um, you know, that, that, that's one of the rules, I think, of the clinician is to suggest which may be the best um, treatment uh, given the other, the other factors that we have. After the ablation, complications are very rare. We've had a couple of patients that have bled and that's usually with very large lesions. And we're talking here about tumours that are less than four centimetres, but sometimes our arms are twisted into treating patients with tumours larger than four centimetres. That's usually in patients who've got comorbidities or per kidney function or maybe a, a single kidney. And it's really the last resort where we would use cryoablation uh, when the tumour is, is much larger than four centimetres. Infection is described in the literature, but as yet, and we've done more than 600 patients now, we haven't had any patients with infection. I think patients will feel some discomfort after the ablation, but it seems to be discomfort rather than pain. And I think the reason is that the nerves supplying the kidney um, are also frozen. And, and, and therefore, although the patient is aware of, of discomfort during the ablation, by the time they wake up, that, that discomfort is largely gone. One exception to this is if we're treating tumors near the diaphragm, Sometimes the probes actually go through the diaphragm and go through the bottom of the lung as well. And after the procedure, patients might get some discomfort when they take a deep breath. And that's simply because there's some bruising around the, the surface of the lung that when they take a deep breath, it moves. How do we follow patients up? Well, most patients get away the next morning and we do a, a, a follow-up survey to see how they're feeling. And, more than 90% of patients feel back to normal after five to seven days. Now, I like to follow patients up with contrast enhanced MRI. So that's an MRI scan with dye. And the follow-up is slightly more intense than we would do for patients having partial nephrectomy. Or, or, and, and essentially that's because we don't know how good our, our margins are around the tumor. We have a pretty good idea, but we do keep a very close eye um, for 60 months, so five years. We use CT and chest x-rays as well, and that's usually uh, defined as, as, as the protocol for the stage of the tumour. Quite often patients will have had previous tumour removed from the other side or something like that, so the stage 
is higher, so their uh, follow-up might be mo more intensive than for the smaller tumor. And bloods are taken at the clinic when they appear there. Sometimes we notice that the tumor gets bigger initially, and that's, I think, just because there's bruising and a bit of bleeding into the tumor. But the most important thing for us is the tumor shouldn't take up dye after we've treated it with any form of ablation. It might take up dye for a couple of weeks immediately after the ablation. That's why we don't scan patients at two or three or four weeks. But after three months, there should be no dye uptake in the tumor. Does it work? Well, it does work. Uh, one of the problems we have um, is that you know, small kidney cancer is quite an indolent disease. So we need to get large numbers of patients um, to compare the different effectiveness of different treatments. Um, and it's quite hard to, to actually um, randomize people to one technique or another. And we did try to do that in this conserved trial. We randomized people to treatment or active surveillance, but we really weren't able to recruit enough patients to, to make it viable. So that um, trial um, closed early. This is some data and the SEER data is essentially all the data that's compiled from treatments carried out in the US. So it's quite a large number of patients. And I think the surprising thing about this was um, that these are all for T1A tumors. Um, only 10% or 11% got treated with ablation. 40% got treated with, treated with partial nephrectomy and 50% of patients, even up to 2018, were being treated with uh, radical nephrectomy for small renal tumors. When we look at all the data, about 7 to 10% of people treated with thermal ablation get a secondary ablation to completely destroy the tumor. Um, when looking at the thermal ablation, um, against partial nephrectomy and radical nephrectomy, the results are, are, are pretty comparable, really. Um, the one thing I think ablation, one of the sort of strong features is, is the preservation of, of kidney function. So um, the patients that we get uh, you know, with very poor kidney function um, we're able to preserve a, a, a lot of that, that function. So I think that's a real bonus for, for some patients. So in conclusion, I think the survival um, rates are similar across all the different treatments. I think for patients with very poor kidney function, maybe there is an argument for doing cryoablation if it's suitable. Um, and the thing is that sometimes we don't manage to treat uh, tumors in one go. So we have to take a couple of goes at it. It just means you come back to the CT scanner and we do it again. But ultimately, I think the results, um, whether it's with one go or several goes, are, are, are relatively comparable to surgery. So what are the key points to bear in mind? I think cryoablation is an alternative surgery in some patients and certainly not all. I think the choice of treatment is usually related to the comorbidities and particularly the kidney function. I think in some cases we're able to preserve kidney function very slightly better than surgery. We might have very slightly fewer complications than surgery but that has to be offset by the fact that sometimes it takes more than one go to completely uh, eradicate the tumour. And that's me finished. Thank you very much, Des, for that really informative talk. Now I'm going to welcome Mike, who's going to share his experience of having kidney cancer and having ablation. Welcome to Mike. OK, so I'm just going to tell you a bit about my kidney cancer journey. Um, basically, I went to my GP back in June 2009. I had just small nagging pain in my left testicle. Um, my GP didn't think it was anything particularly worrisome, um, but he decided to send me for an ultrasound, which I had about six weeks later. 
Um, unfortunately, that revealed a large um, mass in my left kidney, measuring approximately nine by four centimeters. Um, and it would require um, surgery to, to get rid of it. So um, about six weeks later, I had a laparoscopic radical nephrectomy um, performed by Sean VC at Southport General. Um, that was a complete cure. The cancer hadn't spread. Um, he did say that it had been growing for around five to ten years, possibly. Um, and the pathology confirmed it was a firm and grade two cancer. Um, but it didn't need any more treatment, but it would require future surveillance. Um, that surveillance commenced with CT scans with contrast, six monthly annual. Uh, and over the years, he basically phased it out. And I went on to um, ultrasound and chest X-ray to avoid basically having the contrast dye put in me because it's not very good for, for kidney function. On the seventh year, ultrasound, unfortunately, a very small mass was found in my right solitary kidney, measured approximately 19 millimetres. Um, obviously, I was devastated as I thought. I was thinking the worst. I'm going to end up with, with no kidneys and on dialysis. Um, so my, my case was discussed at one of the multidisciplinary meetings on Merseyside. And I had an appointment with Robin Weston at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Um, Mr. Weston was very balanced in his views. He, he pointed out the option for a robotic nephron sparing surgery to remove the tumour, but leave the rest of the kidney. He also stated there was a, a case for taking a biopsy and also for just doing some active surveillance on it. And he also mentioned there was a possibility of radio frequency ablation, which I didn't really know a lot about. Um, the nephrectomy option um, carried a chance of three to five percent that Mr. Weston would have to remove the whole kidney. He said that had never actually happened in his hands, but it was a, a risk factor for me. Given that it was my solitary kidney, the odds of three to five percent I thought were quite high. Um, but he said I was perfectly fine to go away and have a think about it, which I did. Um, I did my own research, went on Google. Um, and I found an excellent video on Kidney Cancer UK site of um, Dr. David Breen, who practices um, at Southampton. Um, basically, about 13 minutes long, talking through the cryoblation procedure. Um, so but by the end of this video, I was quite impressed. I thought this is probably the, the road I want to go down. Um, so I basically got my, my consultant to arrange an appointment with him. Um, so I went down to Southampton, Dr. Breen took through the procedure in detail uh, and I was quite happy to go ahead. The only sort of reservation I had was that any cryoblation could make any future surgery on that kidney more difficult. But I still thought that was a better option than having the partial nephrectomy and having that very small chance that the kidney would have to be removed. So um, I had the procedure some months later. I went into hospital on the Thursday evening. Um, I had the procedure Friday morning. Uh, and I was up and about on the Saturday morning. Um, I traveled back home. Um, over the next three or four weeks, the pain ease. I still had a bit of numbness around this lower area on me on my right side. Um, that eventually went. Within four to five weeks, I was back at work, driving, and I was also back to running sort of low distances. Um, so I was quite, quite happy. Um, I did have a scan at three weeks after the procedure in which Dr. Breen said he was very pleased with the images um, showing that the, the cells were dying off. Um, further scan was arranged um, one year later. Unfortunately, this showed a very rare reoccurrence in the onset of process in my pancreas. Um, again, which is obviously devastating, and this required a massive uh, operation uh, known as a Whipple procedure, and um, that was carried out two years ago, which I'm still recovering from, still have day-to-day -day difficulties. Um, what I would add, though, is my, my cancer nurse specialist is absolutely amazing. Uh, any issues I have, he's just at the end of a phone or an email, and he's also a 
absolutely essential link to my consultant. If he doesn't have the answer, he'll go to my consultant, find out, and he'll be back by return. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so basically, life goes on. I had some blood tests about four weeks ago. Bear in mind, my kidney EGFR round about the time the nephrectomy in 2009 was 65. It was recorded a few weeks back at 71. So I'm very happy with that. Um, I'm due another scan in a few weeks' time, so I've got everything crossed for that one. Um, the reason I've spoken today is basically to highlight that there are other, other options out there. Um, I hope you found this useful. Uh, any questions you have, I'll be more than happy to take. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, for telling your story. It really illustrates the, the subject that we're talking about today, and good luck with your scan. So to illustrate Mike's story as well, I'm just going to talk briefly um, about the follow up. So as I said, to, to add to, to Mike's perspective, I thought it'd be quite um, good to talk briefly about patient's perspective when a, a small kidney tumour is detected and is treated. It's understandable that there is shock and anxiety and, and many people would ask, well, what's next? And later we'll be looking at the resources to, to find out what is next, looking at health professionals, NHS health professionals, support from Kidney Cancer UK, care line and counselling, and also peer support and family is always a good source of support too. It's certainly a time of uncertainty, uncertainty and change. There can be quite an intense period of appointments leading up to the treatment, you know, having symptoms and diagnosis and then leading up to the treatment. Quite a bit of test and information precede these treatments as well and be, can be quite overwhelming. It's quite good to have access to the clinical nurse specialist or the surgeon to help ease that stress by answering questions. Common questions that people ask following treatment at their appointments, things like when can I drive after I've had treatment? When can I go back to work? And commonly, will my cancer come back? Everyone has their own set of concerns or questions. And these questions may be best answered by different people. It's really about finding your go-to person. So a little bit about post-treatment surveillance. Scans are really radiographic confirmation of the treatment success. As Des and Gren both, both mentioned, the frequency depends on the stage. And, and in this talk today, we're talking about stage one and low grade, which, you know, the, the Lubavitch score is, is low generally. And also it can vary according to the type of kidney cancer as well. There is no standard surveillance protocol in the UK, but there are similar regional protocols. With a partial nephrectomy, there's a, an appointment after four to six weeks to, to check the wound and to check how things have went. We briefly talked about watching and waiting for um, small renal tumours that where there's going to be no um, treatment and that's really to measure the growth. And we need to remember as well that kidney cancer at that, that stage is generally low, slow growing, much less than one centimetre a year. And this just measures the growth. Post partial nephrectomy, there tends to be a CT scan of the, the chest, abdomen, pelvis with contrast. Whereas, as Des said, there's more frequent MRIs with, for cryoablation with an additional yearly chest X-ray and blood at the same interval. So if we look at this kind of 10 year follow up, and this is based on the, the West of Scotland follow up for small renal masses. In cryoablation, three, six and 12 months for an MRI, and then six monthly for the next two years, and then yearly. And this varies, as, as Des has said, and then potentially discharging at that point. With partial nephrectomy, it can be, you're seeing you know, four to six weeks after your appointment to check things are okay and to answer any questions as well. But then there's a bit of a gap and you have your CT scan at the end of 12 months. Then at the end of year two and the end of year three, and if applicable, a yearly ultrasound and potentially discharging at year 10, but this varies. As we've mentioned, you know, there's quite a bit of a gap in between treatment. So what do you do then and who do you talk to? And this is why, where the role of the clinical nurse specialist comes in. Your care is their priority and they can be the linchpin in looking after you and your family. They coordinate care and follow up. They can refer on to other agencies for financial and work support, the link to the surgeon and provide that emotional support and reassurance as well. So it's quite good to get the, 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 the contact details of the clinical nurse specialist at your first appointment. Another thing that's really useful as well is peer support. The idea of getting through things together. Many people with small 
kidney tumours manage absolutely fine. But it's quite nice sometimes to talk to someone who's had that experience. We have a closed Facebook group in the charity where people share experiences and ask questions. And we also have support groups which can be organised by the hospital or by ourselves. And they're now virtual and we really enjoy them. We've got regular coffee, cake and chats and uh, many of you join them. Um, and they're, they're really quite fun to be in, but also to, to support each other um, through the different aspects of kidney cancer. So to summarise, there are more, sk small, more small kidney tumours being detected due to um, an increase in people having investigations for other reasons. There are a number of treatment options which we've discussed today. The follow-up isn't standardised in the UK, but each region does have similar guidelines and they can vary and your surgeon and your clinical nurse specialist will keep you up to date with that. And what's important too is just to find that go-to person or group for support so that your, your, your journey is, um, is easier. So I think what would be quite good to do now is to look at what questions and answers the, the audience may have. Hi, um, I was just wondering, I've actually got one kidney. I had my right kidney removed in 2000. It was a 17 centimetre tumour there. And I've now, in 2017, they found a five centimetre one on my, kid, on my remaining kidney and four in my pancreas. Um, my last scan showed that they've all reduced because I'm on pazapanib. And the one on my kidney remaining at the moment is 2.9 centimetres. So what would my chances be? be of an ablation in those circumstances. Do you want me like to, to answer that question? Do you want me to answer that, Des? Yeah, I suppose it, it, it's, this is a slightly different scenario really, isn't it? In that we've got, you're in a situation with metastatic disease on, on treatment. Um, and that's something we, we, we are, are, are less familiar with. We, we tend to treat patients um, in situations like yours, if the tumour was, was growing and the other lesions were static, then there might be an argument for intervening. I'm not sure what Graham would have thought. Um, and we have done that in some cases. Yeah, obviously we don't have all the details of your case, so it's very difficult to comment specifically. But you mm -hmm. have to remember that the treatments that we've discussed today that Des and I have discussed are designed at removing all the cancer that we can see on a scan. And in your situation, whether you to have an operation or ablation, you would still have the disease in the pancreas and the pisoponib that you're on is, is treating all the disease, whether it be in your kidney or in the pancreas. So at the moment, I think that would probably be the best treatment for you. And then there are very specific situations that Des has highlighted there where it may be an option to discuss ablation, but I certainly don't think that would be the first line for you at the moment. And it sounds like your disease is responding very well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, we'll have our, our next question now. I, I live in Wales. Um, is cryoablation available in Wales? I've never heard it spoken about. I recently had um, a radical nephrectomy, but I was never given sort of any options of cryoblation and I didn't realise it existed. And my, my tumour on the CT was 5.5, but in actual, after histology, it was only 3.5. Uh, and I just wondered, are there any centres in Wales? Does anyone know? I'm not aware of any centres in, in Wales, and, and I think that's one of the issues that, that we have um, in that there is a sort of geographical variation in what is available throughout the United Kingdom. Um, in, in Scotland, we have only uh, cryoblation available in Glasgow, so we are getting patients referred from various parts of Scotland. Um, on the back, and, and because of, of this uh, regional variation, a couple of years ago, we, we set up something called the IOUK, which is um, designed to try and 
uh, spread the word of interventional oncology and interventional oncology encompasses ablation and, and other treatments such as uh, blocking the blood supply to, to tumours in the liver and treating liver tumours with, with ablation as well. So, um, you know, there are, are relatively few centres in the UK doing this, but we are gradually uh, increasing the numbers. I, I'm not sure if there are any centres in Wales at the moment. I'm sorry, I can't, can't be any more uh, precise than that. Well, thank you very much anyway. Thank you. We, we, we know that the capacity for cryoablation is, is a big issue and, and we need to, to look at this um, along with with um, people like yourself, Des, as well. And we're just wondering what we can do to, to help that. Yeah, I think um, it's a difficult situation. I suppose we can only really speak for Scotland in that we've only got you know one, one area. Um, there was enthusiasm initially from other centres to to do cryoablation, um, but I, I guess there are other financial constraints. Um, my impression from you know, some centres is they're quite happy just to refer because that's probably cheaper and maybe it's better to have one centre doing larger numbers, um, you know, to keep the, I, I think it's not something that you can dabble with, um, but certainly in, a, in an area the size of Scotland, I think there's an argument for having more than one centre doing it. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think that's it. We've got another question here on the question and answer um, screen as well. Someone's asking, can cryoablation be considered if the small tumour is close to the duodenum? Well, this is, uh, you know, uh, um, it's one of our difficult areas. And Gren knows that the tumours that I like least are the anterior right tumours because um, in, in the slides that I showed, um, there was fat around the kidney and there was a space to inject the saline to try and give us a nice window. And because of the layout of the abdomen, there is one area close to the duodenum where there's very little fat and very little space to inject saline. So um, we sometimes manage and we sometimes aren't able to do it um, frequently. We, we would try to bring the patient in before um, the ablation and we do a series of scans in different positions to see whether we can actually move the, the tumour into a different position simply using gravity. And if we can do that, then we would go ahead and ablate the tumour. But frequently, um, at the MDT, um, you know, the decision is that this is one that that uh, surgery is is maybe a better better option. Okay, thanks for that. There's a question for Mike on the chat. Um, somebody's asking Mike, are you currently on treatment? Um, basically, no. The, the only thing I need to take are Creon tablets because the latest treatment removed half of my pancreas. I need to take tablets to digest the food. Um, I also have to take a proton pump inhibitor called esomprazole to help with the acid. Um, and occasionally on Dancitron, which is an anti-sickness drug because I still get nausea. But again, that's down to the treatment on the pancreas. Um, following the nephrectomy and the cryoblation, um, after the initial painkillers from the procedures, I, w I wasn't on anything. I was fine. That's great to hear. And, you know, after speaking to you over the past few weeks while we're preparing for this, it's great to hear, um, you know, the, the type of activities that, that you, you do, you know, running and, and taking part in your your bowls, which are different from Scottish bowls. I didn't even know there were different types of bowls, but, um, th but there you go. And it's really about re-engaging in life. And, you know, the, the way that we've talked about before, um, especially when it's a small kidney tumour, finding that support and finding people to kind of buddy up with to 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 you know um, take part in in new activities and 
and leave it behind. But it's understandable that people get really worried, especially leading up to their next scan or their next appointment. And it's quite common that, that people talk about that. And at the charity, we can we can support with counselling or just chatting to us on the care line um, or um, speaking to people in the groups about that. But also, you know, it's just really important to, to make that connection with your clinical nurse specialist um, so that you can um, be, feel reassured and because it feels it must feel like a bit of a void in between having this intense treatment and then an appointment quite far down the line for 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 a scan i'd like to just say um on behalf of kidney cancer uk thank you very much for joining us today um we look forward to seeing you again soon we will be having some more live webinars um on on various topics I'd like to, to, to thank the, the panellists, the speakers, Mr. Grain Oates, Dr. Des Alcorn and Mike Tunstall for, for giving us some very informative talks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.